Affairs and Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I want to uh, recognize our Dean, Ken Furton, stand up, uh, the person who created the person who created the School of International uh, and Public Affairs along with the other two schools within Arts and Sciences. The idea for the teaching came from our president, Mark Rosenberg, who wanted a kind of rapid-fire delivery to international events when we have expertise. We have great expertise on this panel, so I want to thank Rebecca Friedman for organizing this and to just welcome you from the uh, perspective of the school and turn over the mic to Dr. Rebecca Friedman, who's director of the European Union programs. You stole my first line. Who's going to say who I am? <laughs> That's okay. All right, everybody, welcome. I'm Rebecca Friedman. I co direct the Miami, Florida European Union Center of Excellence um, here at FIU. And we're here today to discuss Crimea, Ukraine, Russia, and the ongoing situation in that region of the world. So thank you all for coming. Let me, I'm going to take my prerogative and just take a couple of minutes of our precious time to give my own introduction, so bear with me. Let me open by saying that I've been following this situation very closely and I've had a really hard time settling on a perspective um, regarding what's going on, what has happened, and what is to come. I think all we can do at this moment is to understand, based on our on the knowledge that we have, and I suppose hope by having this discussion today and discussions like this going on all around the country right now, we can educate others who will do the same to educate others. When I graduated the University of Michigan with my PhD in the year 2000, which by the way was not a banner year for Soviet and Russian studies, right? Everything was pretty okay then. Um, my lovely advisor turned to me and said, looked me in the eye and said, don't worry, Rebecca, Russia will rise again. And here we are, right? So, what's happening now? I've read pieces that imply that it's the U.S. neglect and underestimation of Russian power since the Cold War that plays a part. That was Navalny in the New York Times. I've read a piece on Monday um, that was about the U.S. president's misunderstandings of Putin himself that helped to create the situation. I read an editorial by rabbis in Ukraine who strongly support Ukrainian sovereignty. And that is, of course, despite the alleged charges of extreme nationalism and anti-Semitism within the new Ukrainian regime. There are those who say Putin will never give up, and he's rebuilding Great Russia or the Soviet state as a present-day attempt to recreate his empire through the Eurasian Union. Others are willing to concede Crimea, as it is, quote, practically Russian anyway, as Khrushchev gave it over, right, in 1954. Others compare this act of, 19, this act of today to the Sudetenland in 1938, and just the beginning of this ideological, political, and military aggression. What do we make of this so-called fascist element in Ukrainian politics? Do the Crimean Tatars really support Crimean annexation? What role, if any, does Russian historical nationalism play? Is this the Cold War 2.0? Why is Crimea part of Ukraine anyway, right? Well, I'll tell you real quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to the experts. On February, I can't help it, I'm a historian. On February 27, 1954, Pravda published a short announcement on its front page that the Presidium of the, Soviet, of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR had decreed on February 19th the transfer of the Crimean Oblast from the RSFSR to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Right? This decree, which was a brief eight lines, stated that this measure was being taken because of, quote, the economic commonalities, territorial closeness, and communication and cultural links between Crimea and Ukraine. In the discussion that followed that brief decree, several members of the Presidium referenced the 300th anniversary of the so-called unification of Ukraine with Russia, a reference to the Treaty of Pereyaslavl of 1654, which was signed by Ukrainian Cossacks and the representatives of the Muscovite Tsar. All characterized the transfer as symbolizing the strength of brotherly ties between the peoples of the Soviet Union. Crimea was, in this way, and you'll read this in the press today, Khrushchev's gift 
to Ukraine. But what of that gift now? Let's see what we can learn today from all of my colleague experts sitting at the table. Now let me introduce them in search modes. First we have, today I'm just going to basically introduce everyone, let them speak, and then we'll do a whole round of questions. First we have Tatiana Konstantinova, who is an associate professor of politics at FIU. Her research and teaching interests include political institutions with a special emphasis on electoral systems and reform Eastern European democratic transition and comparative political policy, public policy. She's published widely on this subject, so I hope they'll forgive me. I'm not going to name publications because there are many for each of them, and we want to talk about Ukraine. There's Marcus Thiel, an assistant professor of international relations and director of undergraduate studies. His research interests are the political sociology of the EU and European, European Union politics more generally, and nationalism and identity politics. He, too, has published lots. Okay? We, then we have um, Vera Belashitsky. I forgot to ask how that's pronounced. I hope I did that properly. Great. We're very happy to have her here. She is a PhD student in politics and international relations at FIU. She works with Professor Konstantinova. And she has an MA in sociology and a BS in Russian philology. She's born and raised in this Belarus. Next, we have Peter Cromer, who just hightailed it down here from BBC, probably going way too fast on the highway, who's Associate Professor of Global and Sociocultural Studies and of Politics and International Relations. His research is on the geography of the former Soviet Union and recently on the geography of elections in both Russia and Ukraine. Finally, we have um, the Honorable Martin Palus, who is a senior fellow at the School of International Public Affairs here at FIU since 2011. He's also president of the Václav Havel Library Foundation and a member of the board of directors of International Platform for Human Rights in Cuba. I have to just pause on Martin's CV for one moment. It's relevance here. He belonged to the original signatories of the Charter 77. Um, served as its spokesperson in 1986 and participated at the creation of the Civic Forum during the Velvet Revolution. After the fall of communism, he was a member of parliament, deputy minister for foreign affairs, ambassador of the Czech Republic to the U.S., and permanent representative of the Czech Republic to the U.N. Phew. Okay. So welcome to each of you. Let me just quickly lay down some ground rules. We have very little time and I've taken up too much of it as it is. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak for 10 minutes, which is hard to do, and I'm going to be a little bit draconian about it as much as I can be, and then we will go ahead for a broader discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you today here and to uh, participate in this discussion about Ukraine, about Russia, about Europe, and maybe about the whole world. Uh, I would like to start with, um, uh, with one uh, observation. Uh, since last November, which means in the last uh, several months, those of us who study post-communist politics have been troubled by the rising tensions and more recently, even by the um, violent developments that uh, in the relations between two former uh, Soviet uh, republics, Russia, the main successor of the USSR, and uh, Ukraine. Uh, well, in the first in, in the first months, um, November, December, this uh, uh, what was happening in Ukraine uh, did not reach the media, and uh, we could hardly hear any comments on this. It was more recently when uh, different uh, experts and observers started to appear and to give interviews and uh, uh, discuss the uh, effects of, uh, of these developments. Uh, about a month ago, I think it was in February, when we had another event here on campus uh, which was devoted again to Ukraine and to then the, the demonstrations that were still ongoing on the Maidan. Uh, we discussed in more detail the uh, geopolitical aspects of, uh, of this uh, um, unfolding crisis and also some of the demands uh, and the so social profile of the protesters who, who were in Kiev, what they wanted, uh, what kind of people they were, and so on and so forth. Uh, today I would like to highlight another aspect of this uh, unfolding crisis, which has been noticed by, uh, by some experts, 
uh, as um, still and still is kind of uh, considered as a distant possibility by, by others. And uh, this is mainly the reaction of the other East European countries and how they feel about what's happening in neighboring Ukraine, uh, about their concerns, about their fears, about, uh, uh, about uh, their thoughts for the future, and so on and so forth. Last week, Timothy Gordon Garsh Arsh wrote in, uh, in a very interesting piece in which he said, Remember, remember, this is about the whole of Ukraine, not just Crimea. Vladimir Putin knows that. Ukrainians know that. Uh, as the reported killing of an Ukrainian soldier shows, there is nothing the government in Kiev can do to restore its control over Crimea. The crucial struggle is now for Eastern Ukraine. Well, uh, Eastern Ukraine appears to be the imminent uh, next uh, um, point of uh, conflict. Uh, still, uh, there, are, there are concerns that uh, the annexation of, uh, of Crimea has ramifications and effects on the foreign policies of uh, the rest of Eastern Europe. There are reasons to believe that a new phase in the development of, uh, between Russia and uh, uh, not only the near abroad, what they call the near abroad there, but also to Europe, to uh, the East European neighbors and to the uh, West European countries and the rest of the world is in the making. We should not keep our eyes closed and pretend the conflict is still sustainable within the territory of uh, the, what uh, we used to know as the pre-March 1914 Ukraine. Uh, in the early 1990s, when the first East European countries started to apply for membership in NATO, they expressed their strong interest in becoming uh, NATO uh, members. Uh, the answer that they, uh, that heard, they heard from Western diplomats is very discouraging, was very discouraging. Basically, they were told that it's better for them to, uh, to stay neutral. Uh, the argument was that uh, there was no cold any, uh, war anymore, there was no iron curtain, there was no threat coming from the East because Russia was not the Soviet, the communist Soviet Union, uh, so they better stay neutral. And they all, the three presidents of the, uh, of the Baltic Republics, for example, answered in the same voice. They said, well, neutrality could be a good uh, option uh, for countries such as Switzerland and Austria, but it's not an option for us. And they continued to insist uh, that their country should become members of NATO. Remembering, the 19, uh, remembering 1940, what happened back then, they worried of uh, what the eastern neighbor would do to, to the, in the future, despite uh, uh, promises of a system of guaranteed security and uh, so on and so forth. So now, more than 20 years later, it seems that their concerns uh, had some validity after all. At present, the Baltic states will uh, still feel insecure, although now they are in NATO, they are members of NATO. Uh, just think what the situation would have been had they not become NATO members. So, uh, so the tensions would have been even uh, higher. Even Poland, uh, that was not a part of the USSR in the Cold War, uh, but had experienced the Soviet invasion before that, uh, feels threatened. Poland, which went through uh, just uh, uh, many Polish uh, people admit, they just had their 25 years, the best 25 years in their history. Now they feel insecure, they feel that, uh, 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 that they don't know what, what the future will bring to them. There are economic concerns too, uh, mainly raised by the high level of energy dependency from, uh, um, from, Russian, uh, from Russia with regards to supply of the gas. Two or three weeks ago, the Visegrad Four countries, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Poland, and Hungary, sent a letter to the US government to allow export of gas to Europe, and especially to them, so that they do not feel the pressure and they can uh, um, behave more independently um, because of uh, the high level of uh, uh, dependence they experience on the part of Russia, coming from Russia. Perhaps most uncertain is the situation in Moldova. 
The Transnistrian region, the Pridnestrovye, has remained a place of unresolved conflict for the, um, for the last uh, 25 years. Unstable politically, Transnistria has a significant Russian minority population and presence of Russian military personnel. Uh, separatist sentiments have been growing there. Now we hear calls to follow the example of Crimea. Now the situation is even more complicated because in order to go and annex uh, eventually uh, uh, the Transnistria, uh, the Russian army has to cross uh, Ukraine or go over Ukraine to Ukrainian airspace. Uh, but the rest of Moldova is a Romanian-speaking population, very close to Romanian culture and tradition. Yesterday we learned about the position of the Romanian government where the president is uh, a rightist in terms of ideology and the um, prime minister is a socialist. They have never before spoken in one voice. Yesterday both of them uh, maintained that there is a big threat coming from Russia and the international community should do something. Even the elites and the, and the public, not only in Romania but also in Bulgaria, uh, feel very threatened. It happens in both countries are NATO members and EU members. Uh, there are, however, significant Russian uh, groups, uh, Russian citizens, who bought um, land and also the homes uh, on the Black Sea coast. Especially in, in Bulgaria, the number is very big. Uh, so, uh, following what happened in um, previous in um, Crimea, what if these people all of a sudden decide that they are not treated well by the Bulgarian government, for example, and they, they seek defense protection uh, from Russia? This is another, this may sound a 